join me in welcoming uh, Susan, Susie Levine, and her husband, Eric Levine. Please come on up. Uh, Susie was appointed yeah, by no, Governor Inslee as commissioner here. for the Employment Security Department on July 9th, 2018, at a time when society is experiencing massive technological and demographic shifts. She brings relevant leadership experience and expertise from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to help people navigate their paths forward to be lifelong career ready. Uh, Susie is joined today by her husband, Eric Levine. Eric is an entrepreneur and small business owner. Eric has had a distinguished career as a group program manager and project product unit manager at Microsoft, as founder, uh, CEO of Seller Tracker, and more recently as a work at home dad. A very, very uh, distinguished career, I will say. Uh, and with that introduction, I am going to turn it over to you two to take Thank us home. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Well, I know that people have, some people have taken off, so I want to thank those who've remained for still being here with us today. Uh, it is such an honor to be here to talk Just about something about which we're incredibly passionate. Eric and I spent two and a half years living in Switzerland when I was serving overseas, and together we went and visited a couple hundred companies and met with thousands of apprentices and became so enamored with what we saw that we knew we had to bring it back. And so it's... Again, such an honor to be able to share with you what we learn. So with that, we will start. So one, one of the things we like to do is put up, these are our two kids, put up pictures of our kids because a lot of times when you talk about apprenticeship, you talk about other pathways, people think of this as an opportunity youth thing. And I think unless we recognize that this needs to be something for our own kids, we're not really gonna be able to sort of move this to the, to the next level. And in the case of our kids, they're both very brilliant, wonderful kids, caring kids. They learn very differently. And so we certainly saw when we were in Switzerland that had we stayed there, probably one would have done a more traditional academic path, and there was the other who we think really would have thrived in an apprenticeship path. So fundamentally, the American dream that uh, we all sort of settle in on has some really specific characteristics. And over time, it's really come to be about a college degree, a house, a car. When I've done surveys of folks over time, they lay this out. But the American dream really is rooted in us getting to a pathway to success. And one of the core aspects of that really is around apprenticeship and how it can get you to a successful pathway. And we have a strong history in the United States of this pathway. You go back to Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin, who both started out their careers as apprentices, and really that is what undergirds our history in the United States. So one very important moment, obviously, in, in our history of apprenticeship is 1937 and the passage of the Fitzgerald Act, which really is the, this is the registered apprenticeship system. Um, for starters, there was a focus on how do you make sure that apprenticeship isn't indentured servitude, but really this is all about modern apprenticeship and how we make sure that we have data that brings everyone together. Now another key moment in time in terms of the history of apprenticeship in the United States was the passage of the GI Bill. Now is there anybody, raise your hand if you've been affected by or impacted by or family members have been impacted by the GI Bill. A lot of folks here. It was an incredible moment in time when we democratized access to higher education. But the unintended consequence of the GI Bill was that it then set university as a gateway to the American dream as opposed to one among many pathways. Now what's great about the GI Bill today is that they have transformed it so that it really can enable multiple pathways, but at the time, it kicked off this process where that then became success, was the equivalent of having this university degree. And unfortunately, we have exported that across the world in terms of people perceiving that that's the key to success as opposed to having a solid career, having a successful life. So when we were in Switzerland, we saw different pathways. We saw a different model. It isn't theoretical. All day today, you guys have been hearing amazing stories about apprenticeship and people talking about braided pathways. We saw a society in which this works, and a society with really the number two GDP, gross domestic product per capita in the world. So it's not, uh, not only is it not theoretical, it's something that's incredibly successful for a nation. And specifically why it's relevant here in Washington State is because Switzerland's not that big of a nation. 
And in fact, it's quite comparable to Washington State's demographics and size and Washington State's um, GDP overall. It's a little bit off, but not too far off, and something that we believe can be applied very much here in Washington State and has a lot for us to learn from. So this is the Swiss dual education system, and I'm just gonna sort of lay it out briefly. In Switzerland, there really are two pathways, and the words that they use are theoretical, to think of what we would think of as a traditional academic high school onto university pathway, and then practical. Now in the case of Switzerland also, they only have nine years of mandatory education. So at age 15, after the ninth grade, more than two out of three, fully 70% of kids in Switzerland go on and become apprentices. Now they are doing either three or four year long apprenticeships, it depends on the particular pathway that they've chosen. There's about 250 different pathways, the full gamut of white to blue collar, so banking and insurance adjustments, software development, on to uh, farmers, cheesemakers, building and construction trades, and everything you can imagine in between. All of the amazing entry level jobs with the opportunity for advancement. The general structure is people will be at work three or four days a week, and they will be at school one or two days a week, and the classes that they're taking are relevant, are germane to the type of apprenticeship that they're doing. So if you're a cheesemaker, you might be studying microbiology. If you are a polymechanic, you're studying math and physics, um, but all in applied ways, all in ways that make sense for the, for the pathways. Now the apprentices are doing real work, and so we'll talk more about the economics of it later, but pretty much from day one, they are working on real products and real services. The other interesting thing to think about is they start very young there, and this is, uh, it can be a little bit daunting. So I, I said again, at age 15 is when most kids are starting apprenticeship. But going back to the seventh grade, all kids are doing career fairs. They're getting exposure to companies. In the eighth grade, they can do what they call schnuppern, which translates to sniffing, literally going and doing one to five day little mini internships, trying, trying these jobs on and trying to figure out if this is what they want to do. Ninth grade, most of them are applying, and then tenth grade, they go to work. Now the really, really key element of the Swiss system, which I think distinguishes it from the German system in particular, which more people are familiar with, are the row of green boxes on the top. That's in essence university. And what they have done, this go, going back to the middle 1990s, they saw a decrease in demand for people wanting to do the practical, the, the apprenticeship related pathways. And a lot of that had to do with the perceptions from the United States that university is required to succeed. So what they did was brilliant. They created what they call permeability, which basically means there's no dead ends. Regardless of where you start, you can move your way around. It may take a little extra um, education, it may take passing a test, but there are no dead ends in the system. And so many people who go and do an apprenticeship, moving along the, the left side there, can then go on to what is called the College of Applied Sciences. They can get a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD afterwards. Or some kids who are starting on the, uh, the high school pathway can decide after high school, you know what, I don't wanna go on to four years of university, I wanna go do an apprenticeship. And so it goes back and forth. The interesting end result right now in Switzerland, it's one of the only economies in the world where overall unemployment and youth unemployment are traditionally in lockstep, usually below 3%. In this particular month right now, it's 2.4% uh, overall unemployment and 2.5% youth unemployment. Now, it's, their overall unemployment number is a bit lower than the US's, but when you get into youth unemployment in the US, it's, it's 2x, you start getting into urban populations and other opportunity youth, and, and the numbers go up. They don't have that problem. They do this for refugees, immigrants, across the board, actually a surprisingly diverse society, four different languages, et cetera. So in terms of the different areas that you might find, these young women are studying to be radiologists and doing an apprenticeship in that arena. This young man is an automation engineer. He's learning programming, he's learning robotics, he's doing great presentations. All of the apprentices are also during that coursework learning citizenship and they're learning f small business and financial accounting. So when they finish, not only do they have 21st century skills around communications, but they can all vote and they all can run their own little businesses. Wouldn't that be fabulous? <laughs> Um, this is us when we visited the post office. Their technology environment is one of the most innovative spaces that we've seen here in the, whether it's here in the United States or in Switzerland, where the post office is also a banking center and they have, as you can see, a center training people to do multimedia, to do cybersecurity and other areas. So Google, sort of famous American company, their largest engineering facility in the world outside the United States is in Zurich. 
Now, interestingly enough, they actually get an amazing amount of sort of uh, uh, PhD and postgraduate talent, really, really great computer science talent. They were having a bit of a hard time finding folks uh, who were uh, starting younger. And so what they finally did after a few years, just going back a couple of years ago, is they started a traditional um, IT and software development apprenticeship four years that like what the banks and many other companies in Switzerland are doing. And so uh, it's actually really, really exciting to see Google doing that there in Switzerland. Our hope is obviously that they bring it back here to the US. We'll talk more about uh, tech companies in a bit. So how do they do this? How does it succeed there? Well, one of the key aspects of it is really that the apprenticeship doesn't define you for life. If you start as a cheesemaker, you don't die as a cheesemaker. But it does prepare you for life. And again, there's that transferability. Some of the best examples are people across the leadership spectra in business, in government, in academia. In the upper left-hand corner is Sergio Emotti. He is the CEO of UBS with $3 trillion under management. He started as a banking apprentice on the banks of Lake Lugano. The upper right-hand corner, Guy Parmelin, he is one of their seven federal counselors. That's the equivalent of, equivalency of their presidency. They have a seven-person federal council. He started as a farming apprentice, and in fact, he's now defense minister. He's in a rotation to become president. He's not the only one. There are two of their federal counselors who started as farming apprentices. The other one is their finance minister, Uli Mauro, who will be president next year. Marcus Bucher is their CEO of Pilatus Aircraft, the one aircraft manufacturer in Switzerland. He started fixing tractors. That was his apprenticeship growing up. And in the lower right-hand corner is a woman who started as a commercial apprentice. And this is the most popular apprenticeship in Switzerland. Think of it as basically anybody with a desk job, whether that's an insurance, whether that's reception, anybody with a desk job is a commercial apprentice. She was the equivalent of their secretary of education and is now the global guru for apprentice apprenticeship and runs an institute at their university. This demonstrates the prestige of apprenticeship, the diversity of apprenticeship, and this notion that Eric talked about before, permeability, because every single one of these individuals, in addition to doing their apprenticeship, went on to higher education. So something that we find very inspiring, that when we're able to get some traction here, we'll be able to have those kinds of examples as well. So if you, re if you remember one single thing about the Swiss model, it really is the role of business. That's, that's also really one of the special things about this. And the simplest tagline is there in Switzerland, businesses are creators and not just consumers of talent. So I think traditionally in the US, what we are used to seeing are companies waiting until 16 years into the education system, kids pop out of college, and then they're trying to sort of pick off the best and the brightest. They work it very differently in Switzerland, so they're starting younger, but the businesses themselves are the major funders of this system. It's not a tax, it's salaries, um, and we'll talk again more about the economics in a second. But last year, Swiss businesses invested about 1% of GDP into this overall system, which is just amazing. The key thing is they don't think about this as corporate social responsibility. It's not an act of charity. They are just, their businesses are just as profit focused as really any other businesses elsewhere in the world. But they, for them, this is really about HR strategy. This is how they find and build talent. Um, they do have some st distinct cultural advantages. People understand this. Now the picture's on the bottom. On the left happens to be, we'll talk about Colorado in a moment. This is a classroom in Colorado where they are building out a statewide apprenticeship system. And as is very common in a lot of classrooms in the US, the pennants in the background show universities. So we asked them, hey, why don't you have great Colorado companies that are participating in your system? We're here in Washington as we talk about what's going to happen in Career Connect Washington. Why not again? If we're going to put up uh, pennants for UW and Wazoo, well, why not for great companies that are ready to hire talent? So the businesses, like Eric said, invest a substantial amount in this system. In fact, 60% of the overall funding for the system comes from the businesses in the form of wages. But it's also in them funding and fueling these associations where they come together, the Manufacturers Association, the IT Association, the Pharmaceutical Association, where together they collaborate to define the competencies and the curriculum. And they're legally required to update those within every five years. Sometimes they'll do it more frequently. So what this means is that their systems are at the pace of innovation, which is really exceptional and really makes them very ready for the future. Those companies coming together, it's co-opetition that they have with one another because they may be competing vigorously, right? Shane, the Shana Corporation and the Levine Corporation may be vigorous competitors, but we come together to define what do we need in our talent so that we grow the pie as opposed to eating each other's pieces of pie. And that's really essential to how this system works. 
30% of the funds are coming from the equivalent of states or cantons, as they're called there, and that's in the form of the education. Eric talked about the one or two days a week that they're in school, so that's what that cost is. Now, what's especially interesting as we think about deploying some derivative of this or some elements of this in Washington State, apprentices are 40% less expensive than high school students for the Swiss because they're only in school one or two days a week. So it's a pretty interesting economic model there. The federal government ensures consistency so that those credentials have currency, so that I know exactly what the apprentices coming out of the Shana Corporation know because they have a standardized credential. Similarly, she knows what mine have. So we don't worry about, gosh, what's the quality of that individual? They're standardizing that across the country. So, for example, you have that today in our trades around um, the journeyman, right, in different categories. You know what they know, and that's really the essential role that the federal government plays along with research. When Eric mentioned in the mid-90s there was this um, effort to change their system to include more permeability, that came out of research that they had done, and they're constantly doing that research. The companies recognize that they pay their fair share within this system. So that's what the companies do. So what do the companies get? Well, I mentioned before, apprentices are doing real work pretty much from the get-go. And in aggregate, when you look across the three or four years, for the companies that participate in Switzerland, which is about 40% of all companies, but much closer to 100% of medium and large organizations, they get on average a seven to 10% return just on the money that they are investing into it. So they're investing typically between 100 to $150,000 per apprentice across the course of three or four years, they are getting more than that back in terms of productivity because these folks are doing real work. Now in simplest terms, traditionally in year one, apprentices, not that productive. They are losing money on them. Year two tends to be sort of break even. Year three is where they're making money. Uh, for things like poly mechanics doing advanced manufacturing, those are four year apprenticeships. They break even much closer to the end, but they are so desperate for the talent. But the basic idea here is they are actively building their workforce, but they're not losing a lot of money to do it. Now, when they're done, they have a workforce that is skilled and talented and understands what they need. They are very, very loyal. Um, and, uh, and so those are really some of the key things. It's a homegrown uh, set of talent. Um, <coughs> Susie, one of the uh, terms they like to use, Susie loves this, is they talk about them being <coughs> Um, life entrepreneurs. You need some water here? Yeah, I'm okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> um, they talk about them being life entrepreneurs, so because they are really learning a foundation. Basically, they're replacing high school with people learning soft skills in the real world. I'm good. I actually have water. Thanks, Chad. I'm good. <laughs> so it's one thing to talk about what's over in Switzerland. That feels so far away, and it feels so unlike where we are right now. Um, although I'll tell you, when I look outside and see Mount Rainier, it's very much like the Alps. <laughs> Just saying. So. Why do we need to adapt or adopt some components? We're not gonna bring it lock, stock, and barrel over here. There's too many conditions that make it fertile ground there for what they've got. But there are things we can learn and apply here. And one of the key things that we need to recognize is that frankly, most Americans are not actually getting a higher ed degree. So I mentioned before, if the pathway to success and the pathway to the American dream is gated by having a higher ed degree, does that mean two thirds of our citizens are not having access to the American dream? Well, when you do studies of people's belief in their access to the American dream, they don't. They don't think they have access to it. But we've got to open up those pathways, and we've got to correct this. So just to, to pick on one particular industry, um, in terms of technology talent and, and software companies, although these days really every company is a software company when you think about IT needs. So right now, this is data from code.org. Our universities in state are producing just over 1,200 computer science grads. There are currently more than 18,000 open positions for people with computer science degrees. So we are a massive net importer of talent. We need to build more of our own talent locally. When you look at the other conditions in the United States right now that make it a very hot prospect to look into apprenticeship, you look at just the conditions for our citizens. Right now, we are bearing $1.5 trillion in student debt across 44 million people, often into their 50s. Our previous president and his wife both still had debt when they entered the White House for their student debt. Holy moly. You have that basically, again, only a third of Americans are getting these four-year university degrees. And right now, while we may say that unemployment is around 3.7%, 
Youth unemployment is almost triple that. And when you go to some regions of Washington State, unemployment is double that in Ferry County, or you go to the Colville Reservation and unemployment is 50%. So you have very uneven levels of unemployment and you have slow wage growth. So the stars are aligning on the business side. This is a historically tight labor market, which presents a great opportunity, and there is a lot of interest for a reason. But right now, there are about 7 million jobs going unfilled for lack of skills. Um, there are, across many different industries, whether it's insurance or aerospace, there are literally silver tsunamis, just tidal waves of people who are getting ready to retire, and no clear plan to find people to be able to replace them. Now, on the positive trend, I think there is an increase in conversation happening around not just degrees as a, as a proxy for, for talent, but increasingly skills and competencies and getting more detailed around what do people really need to know for us to be able to hire them. Uh, the last big thing, and Susie alluded to this before with the, the Swiss model where they are uh, by statute having to revisit apprenticeships on an ongoing basis every three to five years. Doing these kinds of vocational systems where you really have business involved is all about how we deal with pace of change and businesses trying to stay ahead of talent, talent needs and talent demand. <clears throat> so a few different examples of how this model has influenced efforts in the United States. So one of the things I did as ambassador was I was able to get 30 companies to agree to bring their models to their US facilities, one of which was Zurich Insurance Group. And Zurich Insurance Group, just outside of Chicago, where they have their US headquarters, rolled out a program in financial services that's a two-year program in partnership with Harper Community College. During those two years, three days a week, you work at Zurich. Two days a week, you're at Harper Community College. At the end of those two years, and you're receiving a paycheck throughout that whole time, when you finish, you have no debt. You have a job. You have skills. You have a business associate's degree. And you're ready for your future. They didn't stop with just rolling it out, though. They then met with other financial services companies, and now Aon uses it. The Hartford uses their program. And then components of it are being used by other companies like Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase. So that's post high school that they rolled that one out. And a lot of the Swiss companies are doing that in the United States post high school. So um, one of the really, really interesting uh, examples to watch is the state of Colorado. And so when we were in Switzerland, uh, we got to know a particular business leader who came over there and participated in a boot camp. Uh, this was in the summer of 2015. He was so excited, he convinced Governor Hickenlooper to come back with a big group of CEOs and business leaders, academic, philanthropic, state government leaders, and Governor Hickenlooper. They spent about a week on the ground, four full days on the ground. This is early 2016. And more importantly, when, when, they, when they went back to Colorado, they had sort of really been inspired by what they saw in Switzerland, but they decided to take action in Colorado. So what they did less than nine months later was create a statewide intermediary called CareerWise Colorado. Susie and I both uh, serve, both volunteer on the board of that uh, organization. Um, they have a 10-year goal. They're going to be doing basically uh, three-year-long apprenticeships, starting with high school juniors. So people are still doing high school, and then they're amping up work across the 11th, 12th grade, and then they do sort of a, a gap year, a 13th grade. Um, their 10-year goal for this system is to get 10% of all Colorado high schoolers doing this, or 20,000 kids a year in this system. Now, their early pathways here are five different ones. They have advanced manufacturing, and then everything else is white collar. It is IT, business operations, which is like the Swiss commercial apprenticeship, financial services, and then now the second year they're adding uh, different healthcare pathways. The goal for all of these pathways is that there is clear uh, career advancement opportunity, that there is an industry recognized credential, and that kids are earning and learning starting again as high school juniors. They also are uh, gaining college credit because they're doing a mix of high school work and community college classes for specialized knowledge. So we saw this group come through, and as good Washingtonians, we thought, well, we need that. So when we came back from Switzerland, we were able to get Governor Inslee to agree to lead a delegation to Switzerland with many of these leaders. And it really inspired, and again, it was quite an array of leaders from major corporations, from labor, from philanthropy, from academia, and from government. And these are some of the leaders who have committed and have been participating in the design of Career Connect Washington. And we'll step you through just a little bit of it. For those of you who attended Mark Casali's session earlier today, you'll, this'll be a little bit familiar to you. But we're not talking about small companies we are talking about some of the major players in our state. Now that said, one of the things we saw in Switzerland was that the small companies are able to leverage the work of the bigger companies. 
and you can create almost an umbrella environment to make it easier and more turnkey so that small companies can participate in these types of um, activities around apprenticeship as well. So obviously the dream for Washington State as we look at more of a statewide model for youth apprenticeship um, is very much modeled on that public-private partnership. You've got government, you've got industry, both the employers, most importantly, of course, labor, and then on the education side. The key, of course, here, the, the double helix, is all about braided pathways. I mean, I guess, again, what Governor Inslee, what he remembered when we were in Switzerland was no dead ends. Every person we met had taken such a different pathway, even through that Swiss system, and many of them were doing different things than, than where they intended and where they started out when they were 15. So our goal as we, as we build something in Washington State is to scale and leverage all of the amazing intermediaries and STEM networks and everything that's already here, but to really build it up towards something that has more potential to scale. The other aspect is really to create a culture of career here in Washington State. And so while ultimately we want people, we want young people to do these career launch programs when they get further on in their educations, we really want to start career awareness and exploration early on in those middle school years, whether it's with career fairs and job shadowing or tours, and then get prepared in that internship level. But ultimately, again, to be able to really move people towards career and open up more pathways. This is the stair step again. For those who attended Mark's session earlier, you would have seen that goes from career awareness in the early years, career prep in those sort of middle years, and career launch in your final years of school, where you're also getting a post-secondary credential and you're getting paid work experience. So this is the design, the sort of core design of our Career Connected Learning Continuum and what Career Connect Washington will be pursuing. And what's so exciting for Washington State is we're really at the outset of this. And it's been an incredible collaboration across our state to move this forward. So since we got back from Switzerland, we're coming, uh, in, in January it'll be two years. Susie and I have had the opportunity to really travel all over the country. We've talked to, I think at this point, it's about 14 different governors or their senior staffs all over the country in a very diverse set of states. Um, what's fascinating is in all of the different states that we have talked to, IT, advanced manufacturing, and healthcare are typically some of the biggest skill demand areas where they literally, you know, and, and you can go through the numbers for every state, but in pretty much every case, they have no idea where they're going to find the talent to fill the needs that their businesses have. But this, of course, presents an amazing opportunity. I think one of the challenges, so what you see here is sort of a beautiful field of little wildflowers. You know, government loves to fund programs, and programs are great. And in fact, during the Obama time, the Department of Labor did an amazing job of putting a couple hundred million dollars a year out there of different grants to seed amazing activity, lots of trial, lots of data. The challenge is with individual programs is, okay, so this flower is going here, and this little weed is going there, and they're all beautiful, but everything's moving in a different direction. One of the other really major uh, learnings from the Swiss system is that it is a system. Everybody knows where they fit. There is sort of a common cohesion. So rather than a field of wildflowers, what we like to put up and to, to sort of be suggestive is this is a stand of Aspen. Now what's amazing about Aspen, they are one living organism connected by their roots. And so as we build out Career Connect Washington and as all sorts of different states get on this apprenticeship bandwagon, I think the key thing is how do we build systems? How do we build things that can scale? Because again, the goal is no dead ends. We want this to work for every kid regardless of their socioeconomic background. Um, and you don't, but you don't want to put people down a pathway that's going to give them a dead end. So to really bring this home, I think what's important is to recognize this is going to take some time and it's going to take some major cultural shifts. So to give you some of the framework for what we think those shifts will be over time, for one, we need businesses to move from being consumers of talent to being creators of talent. We need to move from apprenticeship having some stigma associated with it to apprenticeship being a status pathway Oh my gosh, your kid's an apprentice? That's awesome. What are they studying? What are they doing in their apprenticeship? What did they make? I can't wait to get that thing, right? We want that to have status. We want companies and organizations to move from thinking about degrees to thinking about skills. In fact, I know I, with an agency of 1,600 people across the state, have asked my HR director to reevaluate every position description for skills and not degrees. I would not have gotten my job if it were just for the degrees. It requires a law degree or a business degree, and I have neither. But it has three little words that made me eligible for my job, which is or related experience. And the governor decided I was close enough. 
There you go. We want to make sure that there's no dead ends, that people always have another direction that they can go, that there is permeability in the system. You can have your credential recognized in the next phase and that the next different levels may understand how to receive those credentials. Again, to the point of the wildflowers to the aspens, we need to think in systems and how do we move from having these disparate programs to having a unified and collective system. And last but not least, I know that Eric and I were born into an environment where you finish your studies and that's it for the rest of your life and you have a couple of careers, maybe, generally just one. Those days are done. Young people coming up today will have between 15 and 20 different jobs and we need people to be comfortable with and to know that we have lifelong learning and that's how we're all going to be able to stay ahead in the workforce of the future. So with that, we thank you very, very much for your participation. And if there's time, we can have take a couple of questions or we can hang out afterwards for folks who have questions. But thank you for your dedication to this area because it's going to be a team effort and we're excited to work with you on this. Oh, sounds like we do have time for so a few questions. I mean, I know people also need to catch whatever rides or drive home to understand that. But yeah, yeah. Any, any questions? And it's hard to see one over up there. here. So. Um, the question was, there's a lot of discussions about speaking to businesses and speaking to schools and that there are programs there, but how from a state standpoint do we even approach this challenge? Is that a good summary? What form does that take? What form does the communication to the stakeholders take? Well, part of the construction of the Career Connect Washington um, strategic plan includes a communications plan in particular. And so to each of those different entities, to businesses, there will need to be a very specific communications plan. How do you enlist those businesses? And one of the first steps was setting up industry sector convenings in the area of IT, in the area of healthcare, in the area of advanced manufacturing. And some of those employers that we listed before, so Amazon is heading up the IT industry sector convening. Kaiser Permanente has taken on the mantle of the healthcare Boeing and SEH America, SEH America is a silicon uh, manufacturer down in Vancouver. They are heading up the uh, advanced manufacturing sector convening. And what they're doing is pulling in input from, those, from their counterparts and their competitors to talk about what are some of the ways that they can start and then get other employers in those sectors on board. What Career Connect Washington will do is set up and fund and fuel regional networks because regionally there will be different variations that will then enlist employers as well as schools as a part of these uh, different networks. So that will be some of the ways to communicate it out. You're gonna be hearing and seeing a lot these next few months. There's going to be a big legislative push around this to get support for this. And then ultimately the goal is to launch it in July. There are some other elements that have already gone live. So last year, uh, Governor Inslee allocated six and a half million dollars in grants to pilot programs all across Washington State that have really helped us learn a lot about what can happen in this Career Connect arena. For example, in Wenatchee School District, they did a really interesting thing where they are the IT employer and they are the school. So there's ways for us to learn from some of those pilots. And the question is, how do we then apply that? And so this next few months as we take, go from having a strategic plan to enacting that strategic plan is gonna be a really critical time and that will include a communications element as well for getting, for getting that message out to those really critical partners. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Wonderful. Eric and I are on the, the kitchen cabinet, so to speak, for Career Connect Washington. And so we, we are not Maude Dedan who's been leading it, but we have really enjoyed partnering with her. Other questions that folks have? I have a question. I thought it was really interesting about starting with seventh graders having um, hiring events or exploratory career fairs, that type of thing. Where would that come from? Would it come from ESD or from the school districts or how do we get that going in the schools? I think the answer is yes. I, I think that it's a combination. I think it's working, it's in close partnership. So Chris Reichdahl and I, as well as Jan Yoshiwara, who heads up our, uh, what's called the State Board for Career and Technical Colleges, we're all working together on identifying where might government participate, but it's also the businesses. 
I think also, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting work that already exists with Washington STEM and all the regional STEM networks. The goal is not to reinvent that. The goal is to leverage that, all those partnerships that already exist. So this is all about, you know, there's a lot of amazing activity, a lot of programs, a lot of different intermediaries and, and STEM networks, et cetera, centers of excellence throughout the state. And so how do we take all those things and build them into a more cohesive system? A good example is Core Plus, right? Boeing Core Plus is something that starts in, the, in high school today. Is it something that they would consider going further upstream kind of thing? So companies themselves may have elements of it too. And, and Boeing Core Plus, as an example, is a curriculum. Um, and it often leads to employment, but there is no actual work component to it right now. So in the Career Connect Washington stair step, to be a career launch program, it would actually have to have a work component. That's, they, that's basically all about what are the standards, whether through registered apprenticeship or otherwise, that comprise an official career launch program. So the goal will be to take what we have, but also to create more commonality stand, you know, and standardization across many different industries so people understand what they're getting. We, had, we visited one company in Switzerland called Ems Chemi, and they make most of the plastic that you would experience in your car. So whether that's in the dashboard or whatever, most of the plastic there, and they have the equivalent of the Pacific Science Center in their facility to invite middle school aged kids to come and see how awesome they are, right? I played with a Van de Graaff generator and my hair went all out. And I was so excited, I was like, I wish that I had been a seventh grader seeing this. I would have wanted to become a chemical apprentice. But so it's how do we get companies to realize their role in this? And that's hard, but it's gonna be something where I think once we get some traction going, we'll be able to get momentum. Yes, please. Oh, hello. Uh, just to comment on the last thing that you said, I don't think it's gonna be as hard to get companies on board as some people in the room might think um, doing this work. So I, I work in K-12, I support a high school and a middle school and I've been doing this for just a year and a half, and every business that I've talked to is like, yes, yes, what can we do? So I guess my question to you would be, you know, as far as working with high school students, and I spend a lot of my time focused on getting these kids to graduation and hitting all their, you know, 24 requirements or 23 with a waiver, whatever that might be. It's kind of like moving the Titanic to get those things to change. So is there something, what would you recommend as the number one thing for someone like myself or other people like myself in the room to implement today? As somebody who's in K-12, well, listen to Chris Reitall, that's first. Um, he's amazing on this front in terms of recognizing the value. If you're, if you're, do, if you're doing uh, industrial drafting and CAD design on the job in your work, well, how might that also play into geometry class? Right, and how do, how do these tie in together? What you can do today is talk to people about what their career paths might be or what their career objectives might be. And I think all too often in education, we talk about people, what's your college objective? Um, there's one school in particular that I visited in, in DC once where they had every one of the classrooms named after a university and all the teachers were wearing university sweatshirts. And that tells you that the goal is, career, is college, not career. And so I challenge those people who are our leaders to instead of saying we need our students to be college and career ready, to say we need them to be career ready, where college is one among many paths. And so that takes a lot of courage to say that because it's become so deeply embedded within us that college is what we celebrate, right? The, per the person who was the first in their family to go to college. Well, how about the first in the family to be able to pay off their mortgage, right? Um, Right? <laughs> uh, and so how, how do we celebrate that people can create things and that creation of something is as awesome as somebody's ability to trade lots of stocks, right? And, and so how are we celebrating the quality and the dignity of work? And so today what you can do is you can point that out to folks, right? How the, the, the materials and the products that they're using in class, how are they made? Who made them? Who are the people that they can thank for that? Pipe fitters, there you go. It's all, the pi it's all about the pipe fitters. Does that help answer your question? Awesome. Yeah, let's, let's take one more question. We, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you. Hi Susie, Chance Garrett from hey, Highline. Chance. Hey Chance, nice to see you. Hey, um, just a question. We, in the system today in the US, it's our colleges are supporting our students going doing that transfer. 
what does that Swiss model look like when their students are going through their apprenticeship? Is there somebody, is it the education system that is supporting it, or is the business and industry supporting those students? So, you know, they got those social and emotional issues that go on as a teenager. So what does that look like? Do you want to talk about that? Specifically in Switzerland or yeah. here? Switzerland. Yeah, so in Switzerland, you know, one of the big things, um, it, it is interesting that kids there at 15 and 16 feel about 10 years older than we're used to them feeling here. Um, they're distinctly though, they are, they are trained for it. They are, you know, they understand that they are dealing with a lot of the sort of soft skills and people skills and things that they wouldn't normally have to deal with if people just showing up to work are 22, 23, 24. Um, and so they actually have to get, each business needs to get certified by the government. They get support for this, et cetera. Bigger businesses really um, invest a lot in this, but the most basic thing is every apprentice in the country will have a dedicated mentor. They will typically rotate mentors a lot. Um, and that is someone that they are working with all the time and learning from, and it creates also really interesting two-way pressure because uh, the mentors are learning an awful lot from the apprentices. Um, so as a society, I think they have just figured out that that's part of the role of business and business leaders and these mentors is kids are not just gonna have sort of professional issues, but there, there are gonna be real world and interpersonal and home issues, et cetera, that they have to deal with. And so they've figured out how to do that, but they have supports in their system for that. They have a lot of supports in their system for even a step before that when kids are trying to figure out what career they wanna pick, what, what the first apprenticeship is. Um, they have career centers in every canton in every city so the kids can actually do a year long process to even figure out what they wanna do. And so they just start everything so much earlier. Um, now the flip side is what you see from these kids, even just six months or a year in, they're treated like adults. They're sort of held to high standards. They're getting paid. They're being you know, asked to show up, whether it's 5 a.m. or 7 a.m. or whatever, depending on the kind of job they're in, and they do it, they step up. Um, and so when it's amazing, I think we would see that, we're seeing it, the same thing in Colorado, that these kids at age 16 who are starting apprenticeships there are suddenly you know, sort of just supposed to perform in the workplace. And they're like, this is very different than homework. Um, but you know, even in the first year and a half of it, they are seeing sort of this incredible sort of pivot from these kids. Now that said, in Colorado, for the business support services team, they did deploy some counseling support because they realized that the business mentors were not equipped for adolescent problems. And so they are available to help coach and counsel the mentors to be able to deal with somebody who's got an acne outbreak, right? Or who didn't get the call back and is just dejected or whatever happened in their life that became their, their, their center of gravity just plummeted. And so Colorado has worked on how do you crack that nut and how do you train those mentors and what's also fascinating about that is it's training people for initial management, right? It's starting them out and almost training wheels for a management position of how do you manage people, but at a much smaller scale. So there's a couple of ways to think about it. It would be a great question also for Lynn Strickland from AJAC to find out what they're doing here across the state with their deployment of youth apprenticeship because I'm sure that the employers working with them are running into the same challenges and I suspect that they've probably worked on cracking this nut here. Thanks, Chance, for the question. All right, well, again, we can hang out a little bit longer if folks want, um, but thank you so much for the yes. opportunity to be here. Thank you very thank much. You. Oh, thanks. A little swag for you. All right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Really appreciate it.